Well, good evening, midweek. How are we, family? You doing okay? Good. It is so good to be with you tonight. Um, how's your Valentine's week going? That's tomorrow, by the way. Some of y'all are, Ugh! it's Valentine's tomorrow. Well, it's been going pretty well in our house. This week we learned that our four-year-old daughter, some of you know we have a four-year-old girl, she let us know she's getting married um, to a little gentleman in her class that we, I think, approve of, right, babe? We'll see in 14 years um, how he turns out. And then our son is doing this thing now where Dawn and I will hug you know, because we love each other as husband and wife. We hug, and he freaks out. He will cry. He will run and grab my leg. He doesn't like it when we hug. And so that's how it's going in our house this week. That's how love is being celebrated. Um, I hope yours is going a little bit better. But this is what's so interesting about parenting young kids at ages three and four. I don't understand them. I don't understand why they do what they do, and more often than not, I don't understand why they say some of the things they say, and sometimes I don't understand them at all. For example, Miles will say this thing. Um, sometimes he'll say, Mom, I'm fart-charated. And I'll turn to Dylan and go, did he just say he's a fart? And he'll say it again, Mommy, I'm a fart-charated. And then I'll turn to Brooklyn and say, can you, can you help me? But she's four, and she's just trying to get cookies before dinner. So she's doing her own thing. And we'll go back and forth, and I'll get anxious, and he'll get anxious because I can't understand him. But usually, more often than not, what will happen is we'll figure out, oh, oh, okay. What he meant to say was, Mama, I'm frustrated, right? But sometimes, and you know this if you've been around young kids, Sometimes they take too long, and the mystery, we don't have all day to solve it. And so you go on with your day, and you have no idea what they say. And so sometimes I'll get into the car, or I'll walk into work and be like, I sure hope whatever Miles was saying wasn't important enough, so that in 30 years he's not sitting on a counselor's couch going, my mom didn't understand me. And I'm like, well, I didn't. I didn't understand you, right? But as I was thinking about this week and these interactions with our kids and how sometimes I don't get them, I don't understand what they're saying, I asked myself this question. And I asked, do I treat my relationship with Jesus this way? Where sometimes it's really clear what he has to say. And I understand him from the scriptures. I understand what he's trying to say to me in silence and prayer. But other times, I'm like, I don't know what you're saying, Jesus. The moment is dead, right? There's no hope in understanding what you're trying to say. And so I move on because it's past and I'm hopeless now. And he's saying, yeah, that time in your life where you sat across the table and you said this relationship is dead. Some of you can resonate. Or you're calculating the numbers in the books and you're trying to look at your finances because you wanted to start that business. You're like, nope, there's no hope here. That's dead. Or perhaps some of you who are looking at colleges or you're in college, you're like, you know what? That opportunity that I had, it's gone to go study overseas or to go serve that place on mission. It's dead. And maybe you understand that Jesus was present he was there, but it wasn't very clear. His intention wasn't clear. His sense of urgency wasn't clear. You misunderstood or maybe didn't even hear him at all. And so tonight, church, I think the Holy Spirit, by God's Holy Spirit, he wants to teach us something new, not just about who he is, but how he speaks to us. And we're actually going to look at a passage that we looked at this past week. And if you were here for our Journey Through John series, it's John 11. We'll be in John 11 tonight. And if you're doing the Journey Through John study, you're going to read about it tomorrow for day 14. So whatever God's doing in this church, there's something really interesting about John 11 this week. I think there's something he really wants us to understand. We're not just going to look at the miracle. We're going to look at how Jesus spoke to the dead thing. We're going to look at how Jesus spoke 
to the dead man. And church, as I was praying over um, our time together tonight, I think there's something new that God might want to do in our understanding of resurrection. I think there's something new that he wants to do if we'll lean in and listen and understand not just that he brings dead things to life, but how he speaks has everything to teach us about how he brings dead things to life. So we're going to start in John 11. If you're with me, say amen. John 11, we're going to start in verse 38. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version. It says, Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. So here, let's back up a little bit, because we have to understand, it says, then Jesus deeply moved again. And based on the translation that you're reading, deeply moved, when I've read this before, church, I've read it as he was moved with compassion. He was moved with tenderness. He was moved with love for this man. But here's where the context of the language is everything, because this word in the Greek doesn't mean compassion. It actually is more closely knit to agitation. But it said he was deeply moved again. So we have to say, where was he deeply moved before? And this is where we rewind and go to verse 35, and it says, Jesus, what? He wept. So in the way that we understand this, we know that Jesus loved Lazarus. We know that he had compassion for him. We know that he was a friend of the family. He knew Mary and Martha. He had been with these people before. There was something about this family that his heart was connected to. But we have to ask, why did John write that Jesus was agitated? See, the way that Martha and Mary and the Jews were weeping, if you look at this word, it's clio. Everyone say clio. And it appears 40 times in the New Testament, right? And it's this sorrowful weeping. It's the kind of weeping that happens when you're grieving someone that you dearly, dearly love. But then you look at when it says Jesus wept, and it's a completely different word. This word is de cruel. Everyone say de cruel. And it appears one time. There was something different about Jesus' weeping here compared to how Mary and the other Jews were weeping. And the people who've studied this passage for years and years, they say that maybe Jesus was agitated. He was deeply moved again after he had wept with this almost silent weeping. That kind of decruel weeping is silent to himself. Maybe because he was looking around and saying, these people that I know and love, do they really have faith in me? Do they really believe? They've seen me do miraculous and wonderful things, but do they actually believe that I am who I said I was? And my question, my first question for us tonight, church, is when you think about the dead things in your life, the dead places, the places where you have no more hope in your life, I'm sure you can call one to mind. If Jesus is in your midst, is he weeping? Is he perhaps a little sad because we are faithless? Is he calling us to a deeper level of faith in him? 
Yes, he loves us. Yes, he's moved to compassion. But is he saying, these are my people, they should know who I am. So then we get to the tomb. And I want to show you just a few visuals of what this tomb would have looked like. So here you have the inside of the tomb where Lazarus was thought to have been laid at Bethany. So you see people nowadays, they leave prayers at his site with the stones. And sometimes more than one person was buried inside these tombs. And in the next picture, you can see kind of the entrance, the lower entrance to the cave where the opening is. And then lastly, see, I've always imagined the tomb is like something I'm facing forward. But this tomb, you actually entered it and got out of it through a hole in the ground. So Lazarus would have come out of the ground instead of head on, right? So this is just for context of what kind of tomb we're talking about. So when Jesus told Martha, take away the stone, we have to understand, she's thinking it's the fourth day. What did she say? There's an odor. There's an odor here. It stinks. He's been dead four days. And we understand, yeah, four days is a long time, so he was really, really dead. But a layer deeper is that in Jewish tradition, they often thought that the soul of a person would hover next to a body for three days. So there was still hope. For three days, there was hope that maybe the soul of a person would re-enter the body and that person just might come back to life. But on day four, that soul was departed. Day four, that soul was gone. And with it, any hope of that person coming back to life. So it wasn't just that four days was a long time for a person to be dead. In Martha's context, day four meant, no, Jesus, you're really too late. You're really too late. My hope is gone. This man's soul is gone. My brother is gone. But Jesus says, hey, will you take away the stone? And I find it so interesting because what he says, he says, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And then it says, so they took away the stone. Now, when you think about belief, for me, belief is cognitive. It's something that I think. It's something that I'm convicted of on my inside. But here, Jesus says, did I not tell you that if you believed... And then he tells her to do what? Something active. He says, take away the stone. This tells us something new about what Jesus is teaching us about belief. Belief isn't just up here. Jesus says, all power is in me, but I invited you, Martha, to participate in what I am doing. There's something I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to get involved. I'm asking, will you step up to the plate and say, I trust you. I don't just believe you, Jesus. I trust you. And they acted. So, is Jesus finding you faithful in the midst of the dead thing, and how might he be inviting you to participate? Because let's not get it wrong. All power is in him. But he says, did I not tell you that if you believed, now I'm inviting you to step in, and will you take away the stone? I imagine Martha leaning down, and maybe it's with a few other people. They're taking away the stone, and maybe there is a stench sometimes saying yes to Jesus's invitation, even though he holds all the power, gets us closer to the, the dead thing. Sometimes he asks us to move closer to the thing in our lives that seems dead. So he says this, he invites her to participate, and then he prays. So he prays not just for his own benefit, but so that others would know that what he was about to do was directly in response to what his father had asked of him. We know that, that this was Jesus' act of obedience to his father. And then we get to verse 43. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Now let me ask you a question. In your quiet time, how do you read this? What does Jesus' voice sound like to you? If you're like me, if you're like me, oftentimes you'll read it as, oh, Lazarus, come out. Very matter-of-factly. But we have to look at, this is a shout. Jesus shouted this. It's a kradgodzo. 
That's the Greek word. He shouted this loudly. It appears nine times in the New Testament, eight in the Gospels, six in John's Gospels, and three times when it came to time for Jesus to be delivered to death. So this is a shout. This is the same shout when the demons came out of many and shouted, you are the son of God in Luke 4. This is the same shout that was heard when the crowds cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the same shout that the crowds cried, not this man, but Barabbas. When Pilate asked, hey, who do you want to be spared? This is the same shout when the chief priests and the officers saw Jesus and cried out, crucify him, crucify him. This was a shout. This wasn't a matter of, like, I sometimes envision Jesus in a white robe with his hands out like this. Like, Lazarus, come out. But it wasn't. Now that we know that there was maybe this angst in Jesus coming to the tomb, this agitation, he was deeply moved knowing how he arrived to the dead place. He shouted, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus, come out. That changes things. That changes things because what Jesus was doing, he was saying, I have the power and authority and command over the dead thing here. I'm the one that causes death to come to life. And I have a question for us. When we think of Jesus speaking to the dead places in our lives, the, the places where we've fallen asleep, how do we hear him? Do we hear him with this, hey, come out? Or do we hear his voice with the command and all authority that he has in his person as the son of God? See, the people listening to him knew that there were mediums and false prophets who were telling them about the times to come. They would have read the same words as the prophet Isaiah had written years before. It's from Isaiah 8. When Isaiah wrote, someone may say to you, let's ask the mediums and those who consult the spirits of the dead with their whisperings and mutterings. Their whisperings and mutterings. They will tell us what to do. But shouldn't people ask God for guidance? Isaiah writes, should the living seek guidance from the dead? Here, Isaiah is talking about the godly using the authority of God as shields against the voices that are false. He's talking against the soothsayers and the spiritists and the Miss Cleos, God bless her, of their day who were whispering and muttering because they did not hold authority. They were not speaking truth. So in contrast, Jesus shouts and he says, I am the one. And I read this and I understand how they would have heard Jesus in this time. And I'm going, who have I been listening to? In the dead places in my life, the times when I felt hopeless, when I felt despair, am I listening to those who are whispering and muttering? Am I listening to the social media commentators? Am I listening to the sportscasters? Am I listening to the news anchors? Am I listening to the relative at the dinner table who's a conspiracy theorist and always knows what's going to happen in like two years? You're laughing because you have one. And <laughs> your family too. Yeah, or you are them, right? <laughs> but Jesus is saying there have been so many voices speaking to you, directing your hope. There have been so many false voices telling you what's going to happen, and they're not right. In contrast to the whisperings and the mutterings of the lesser gods, Jesus exerts his authority and his power and his command and his might, and he says, I am the resurrection. Lazarus, come out with a mighty shout. This changes my understanding of resurrection, friends. This changes how I think about what's possible. Because many times, when I think about resurrection, when anyone has taught me about resurrection, it's when? It's in the future. It's what's going to happen at the end of days. It's what's going to happen then. 
But Jesus is saying, no, there's a deeper level of resurrection and understanding that I'm bringing to you right now. We're talking about a right now resurrection. And Jesus, he did this miracle for Mary and Martha and all the Jews who are on looking. But I want to look at this, what this was like for Lazarus. Because this man was at the center of this miracle. And I think if we take a, a deeper look at his experience, we'll understand that resurrection and new life isn't just for the final day. It's for this day. And the thing that you thought has been dead for so long, Jesus is on the scene and he's wanting to change it. He's wanting to give you a new understanding of what he can do, of who he is because of his power and authority in your life. So let's look how Jesus speaks to Lazarus. The first thing he spoke to was the cave. You think about the context of your life. The cave is a dark and cold place. The cave is a place where you never thought you'd end up. It's a place where darkness thrives, where you feel alone, and some of you are saying, you know what? I've put myself in one before. Because of addiction. For me, I was in a cave of soothing with overeating and food. Some of you, you got into that relationship and it's felt like a cave. A dark, cold, and lonely place. That job, it feels like a cave. But what Jesus does, he says, this isn't just for the future. I'm not just speaking to darkness. I'm wanting to speak darkness into light. See, Lazarus, in the way that we show the pictures of those tombs, he had to come out. There was a transformation, not just in him, but in his environment. Jesus said, right now, I'm calling you out of darkness and into light. And some of you need to hear tonight, Jesus is waiting for you in the light. There is no dark place that he cannot call you out of. Whether you feel like someone has put you there in your pain, in your circumstance, and whatever you're going through, or if you feel like you've put yourself there yourself and it's on you and you're carrying shame, and that shame and that guilt eats you up every day. Jesus wants to speak to our caves right now. He's saying, I'm calling you out of darkness. And right now, resurrection looks like my power bringing that into the light. Friends, there are a lot of dark places in our world, aren't there? And if you're like me, you'll look at the darkness and say, it's winning. That's what it looks like. It's mighty lonely. It's mighty dark in a cave. <laughs> That's all you can see. But Jesus is saying, no. The cave does not have the final word. Today you can find light in me. He told them in John chapter 5, just a couple of verses before, he said to the Jews, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. When all who are in the tombs. And we'll talk about that word all because this isn't all, this is Lazarus. But he told them this would happen. What part of your life feels dead in a cave? What part feels dark and lonely and cold? Jesus promised you that for right now, he is enough to call it into the light. So Jesus not only spoke to Lazarus's cave, his environment, he spoke to his conscience. He spoke to his state of being asleep and he woke it up. He said, wake up, Lazarus. Remember, awake, O sleeper. He says this to Lazarus. So there was one, uh, well, when Brooklyn was first born, um, when Miles was first born, we decided to take both her and Brooklyn, uh, him and Brooklyn, to uh, Disney World. And they were super young, but Brooklyn was really excited about going on the teacup ride. And so we went on all these other rides. We had lunch. It was super hot in Florida. And finally, we get to the teacup rides, and we get on the ride, and I kid you not, they're pushing the button, they cl 
close the door. I look at Brooklyn, who's sitting in Delwyn's lap, and she is asleep. <laughs> and I said, oh my gosh, we're not going back to Disney World for like another eight years. My child's going to miss the one ride that she's been so looking forward to. And no matter what we did, we could not wake this child up. She missed the one thing that was her deepest heart's desire. And I think some of us are still asleep. God's placed desires in our hearts. He's given us things to be invited to that he wants us to do on behalf of his power for the kingdom that's at hand. And we're asleep. We've been lulled to sleep by the wrong voices. We've been lulled to sleep, perhaps by disobedience. We've been lulled to sleep. And he's saying, not only do I want you to come into the light, I want you to wake up. Because there is more purpose for you beyond what this dead situation looks like right now. See, we go on to read past chapter 11 that so many people believed in Jesus because Lazarus was raised from the dead. There was more that Jesus had in mind for this, but Lazarus had to, to wake up. And some of you, the dead places in your life, you've fallen asleep to the possibility. You've fallen asleep to what he might want to do in and through you. Perhaps you used to have a passion, a burning desire to go and meet some need, some broken part of our world. But because of apathy or hopelessness, that's died. And you're asking, can that actually happen? Can Jesus actually work through me? But Jesus, in all power and authority, he shouts, come out, and with it, Lazarus comes into the light and he wakes up. See, earlier in the same exact uh, passage, John 11, 11, he said, after saying these things to him, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. And this is where I find Jesus really funny because the disciples thought, what, that Lazarus was snoozing? And they didn't get it. And so the Bible simply says, okay, Lazarus has died, right? He had to spell it out to these disciples. But some of us are confusing being like asleep and dead. And Jesus is saying, I want you to wake up. I invite you to wake up. So in how Jesus speaks to Lazarus' death, he speaks to the cave, the dark, cold, lonely place. He speaks to the conscious. He says, I want you to wake up. I don't want you to be asleep anymore. Where have you fallen asleep? And then he speaks to the cloths. I love this last part because it's so easy to move on. And I'll just read it for us again. In verse 44, the man who had died came out, Lazarus came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. See, the way Lazarus was buried, he was probably anointed with oil. And then the way that they wrapped linen cloths around dead people is they made sure that the, the mouth could not fall open. So they wrapped the head this way to make sure that the mouth was secure. So Lazarus, when he came out, when he was awake, he could see. His eyes were not covered, but his mouth was bound. But Jesus said, in front of all these people, unbind him and let him go. See, Jesus said, when I call things to life, it's not just enough from darkness to come to light. It's not just enough for Lazarus to go from being asleep to coming awake. I'm now going to speak to Lazarus and say, let go. You are loosed. Some of us, we get darkness to light. Some of us, we get being asleep and coming awake. But some of us are standing outside the very tomb that Jesus called us out from, and we haven't walked forth in freedom. We're still standing there with the cloth tied around us. We're still bound. When Jesus said, you can go. And the way that I think about this church are all the ways that that inner voice tells you you're not good enough. 
and it's not the voice of Jesus, the voice that tells you you're not good enough, you're not lovable, you're not worthy, no one cares about you. There's so many lesser voices that are trying to keep you bound when Jesus called you out. And I think an understanding of a right now resurrection, not just waiting for Jesus to come back. I joke all the time, I'm like, Jesus, I'm ready whenever you are. I'm ready for you to come back whenever you're ready. But Jesus has more to do. And that's because his resurrection power is available right now. Some of us need to step into the light. Some of us need to come awake, but some of us, church, need to walk forward in the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. We need to tell the voices, the ones that have been telling us lies, to calm down. Because they're not the ones that have authority over us. So I read this passage, and just a few chapters over in chapter 19, it says that Jesus was wrapped in cloth. (laughs) Those cloths were never meant for Lazarus. They were meant for him. He was the only one that could conquer them fully and forevermore. But Jesus was doing something else. See, we just read that back in chapter 5, He said, an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Augustine said that had Jesus not said Lazarus' name, all the dead would have risen. Because he just said here in chapter 5, an hour is coming when all, not one, all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. But it wasn't time for that. Jesus just intended for Lazarus to come out. Had he not said Lazarus' name, I think all the dead would have risen. And we would have been in a First Thessalonians moment. This was Paul's words to the church in First Thessalonians. He said, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from a heaven with a what? Cry of command. A shout of command with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. See, what Jesus was doing here with Lazarus was a foreshadowing. He was saying, this will happen, the end of days, but it's also happening right now. And church, we are about to be in the Lenten season starting on March 6th. We're about to enter into the celebration of Easter and resurrection. And this isn't new for most of us. Most of what I've said tonight feels familiar. But what I think is new, and I think what the Holy Spirit wants for us tonight, right now as a church, is to have a deeper understanding of Jesus' resurrection power. He's saying, you're not tapping into all that I am and all that I have. There's more to what's possible right now. Yes, in the future, I will come back with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and the sound of the trumpet. That will happen. But I'm also on the scene right now, standing before the dead places in your life, shouting, come out. Come into the light. Come awake. Be unbound. Be set free. And I wonder if right now he's wanting the church to understand resurrection as a right now resurrection. There are so many dead places in this world that need his saints to walk forth in freedom and with that kind of authority that he's given us by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's saying, will you come awake? Will you step into the light? Will you not let the mutterings and the whisperings of the spiritists, of those who don't have as much authority as I do, will you lay them aside? Will you shut them out? Will you refuse to listen? Say the one I listen to when he calls is Jesus Christ. 
That's the one I listen to when he calls. Friends, this was a miracle for those who were watching. But it was also an extremely personal miracle for Lazarus. And I don't just want us to look at this as Lazarus' miracle. We're a church that's filled with people who are still in caves, who are still asleep, who are still bound in cloths, and some of them are sitting right next to you and you don't even know it. But the beauty of this church and the beauty of this community is that we can pray over each other, we can encourage one another, those of us who have stepped into the light, those of us who've gone through seasons of death and have seen darkness overcome, can encourage us in their faith. And so tonight, I wanna to try something a little different, trusting that the Holy Spirit is here. He's been waiting on us since before we got here. And I think he's wanting to do a new thing. See, some of you, are, you're still in days one, two, and three of that which is dead. You still have a little bit of hope that maybe the thing can come to life. But some of us in this room, we're in day four. And we've said the same thing that Martha said. Jesus, it stinks. I don't think you can fix it. My marriage stinks. My bank account stinks. My relationship with the church stinks. My relationship with you stinks. I don't know if you can do anything about it. Friends, I want you to look at this prompt and I want you to put your name in it. That blank is your name. Cindy, come out. Darren, come out. Brian, come out. Amy, come out. Sarah, come out. He's saying right now, will you come into the light? Will you come awake? Will you be set free? Not just believing that I've done the thing before, but that I can do it right now. Oh, that takes so much faith. That takes so much faith. And so I'm going to give us some space to think about the dead place in your life and ask, what might Jesus want to resurrect in your life, in you right now? because he can do it. Now, if you're like me, you're going, Ashley, I've been let down before. I'm with you. There have been moments in my life where I knew Jesus could do it, but he didn't. And I don't understand why. But I wonder if I can still live differently as his vessel, as his servant, as someone who he has sent and who he's given his Holy Spirit to, if I say, I believe still in right now resurrection, because at the shout of command, darkness comes to light. Those who are asleep come awake and those who are bound are set free. So perhaps you're prompted to pray with the person you came with to pray right now resurrection over them. Maybe you have the boldness and courage to look to someone to your left or to your right and you pray with them because we're a family. Perhaps you just wanna take some time alone and reflection. We have our prayer walls and you want this to be a personal experience with God. But this might take some time because things that are dead, they're dead for a reason. So would you trust him and let him guide you, let him love you, and let him remind you that he's not 
a misunderstood toddler. He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And when he speaks life, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. I am everything you need. There's no confusion there. Will you let the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords speak life over you right now?